welcome to this episode of the Star Wars Universe podcast. It's me, Aaron, the co-host and now actual host host for the Ahsoka series. I'm joined by Alex Corman, my wonderful friend. He was on two weeks ago. Say hi, Alex. Hello, everyone. How are you? I am wonderful after the episode last night. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really funny. I texted Alex the moment I watched it. Bro, in all caps. Alex goes, silence, I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> and then like 40 minutes later, he texts me and goes, wow. They really said, and then it's just a screenshot of the Return of the King, like, um, intro. <laughs> and then Dave said, Return of the King again. <laughs> and I was like, couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> yeah, I sent that meme to probably seven people. As you should. It's a good I- one. <laughs> Oh my god, dude, I was just in another plane of existence last night. That was that was the payoff. That was the payoff. That was the payoff. Um, do you want to give a little Yeah, I've got a little uh, plot summary. Yeah. I tried to look it up on Wikipedia like uh, Matthew did last week. I was not so lucky. So, here's my <laughs> written out plot. Um, first, we start off with Ahsoka and Huang inside of the space whale. Kind of just chat in um, Huang talking about stories he used to tell at the temple they're reminiscing and then next we see morgan and squad um on whatever her giant hyperspace ring ship is called they approach peridia and then they get on a shuttle go down they meet the um night mothers i guess yeah yeah, yeah the, I mean the great the great mothers of the night sisters. The great mothers of the night sisters, which we have things to talk about, but we'll get there. And oh, then we have a lot to talk about. After that, they transfer prisoner Sabine um, into the prison on Peridia, and then Balin and Shin kind of talk about his experience with the order, like some stories from the past, and kind of his goals now. Uh, then Thrawn pulls up. Yeah, Thrawn pulled up. It was great. Uh, Then they start loading some cargo from the catacombs of Peridia onto the Chimera. Um, After that, Thrawn is alerted of Sabine. He goes, he meets up with her, and he's like, yes, I will respect Balin's promise to you. Here's a howler. Go find Ezra. And then they watch her ride off, and Thrawn says to Balin and Shin, follow at your own pace. Uh, After that, Sabine is ambushed by some local raiders. Really, it was giving Tuscan for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Down to the noises. Um, Tuscan mixed with like the weird kind of outfits you see on Chaku. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they do that. Uh, she fights them off. Or yeah, her howler leaves her. She fights them <laughs> off with her Mandalorian things uh, successfully to an extent. Then gets knocked down, loses her guns, picks up the lightsaber, absolutely balls out and just kills all these guys, except for the leader. She kind of like wounds in the face and he runs off. Then um, she finds, oh, her howler like comes back and she's all mad at it. They have this little fight and then the howler sniffs out these rock turtles. The rock turtles get up. They come to find that the rock turtles know Ezra. They bring her to Ezra. The payoff, the reunitation, the reunion, okay, of the century we've all been waiting for. And then, <laughs> look, my brain paused, okay? Anyways. It's fine, keep going. Um, and then at the end of the episode, we see Thrawn talking with the great mothers, and they say how they feel a Jedi approaching. He says, we're going to assume it's the recently, quote, deceased Ahsoka Tano. And then he orders them to, oh, it was so good. He tells Morgan, if any night whales approach Peridia, or sorry, if a star whale approaches Peridia, destroy it with prejudice. And then the episode ends. (sighs) Initial thoughts, go. Okay. Oh my God. Initial thoughts. Okay. 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 If you Hold have on. Somewhere else wait, to start. Wait, go ahead. Wait, wait, no. Let me pull up my notes. Let me pull up my notes. <laughs> I'll give you my my initial. So I actually text. I was texting with Aaron last night about this, but this is like you know. It actually, I went back and watched it today, and the first line Thrawn says um, 
Oh, God. I can't remember. Now, of course, I'm going to blank on the exact wording. But he basically says something along the lines of, you know, what's been a dream for so long is now a reality. Yep. Um, and that, to me, speaks to all of the Rebels fans, all of the fans of the novels dating back to the expanded universe. Because, yeah. you know, for those of you who might be a little more casual and just enjoying the live action of the movies, Thrawn dates back to when George Lucas still owned Star Wars. He dates back to the Heir of the Empire novels that Timothy, Th- uh, Timothy Zahn wrote. Timothy Thrawn. And, yeah, Tim- Timothy Thrawn, Timothy Zahn, whatever. Um, who I've actually met at a con and is super nice. Super cool. Um, but he, uh, you know, he also then wrote six Thrawn books in – they're now you know, canonical Thrawn books since Disney uh, acquired Star Wars. Um, and Thrawn was really introduced to the larger fan base um, as the main villain in Rebels seasons three and four. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just has this aura – about him this this dark aura but he never like he's clearly a villain but he never like comes across as as like as evil or vile as the emperor per se might be but yeah. very kind of like a Tarkin very sharp and cunning he's calculated and I feel like he's calculated and I feel like just seeing him in live action he you know it's the same voice actor from Rebel was playing him in live action and it's just the performance is perfection. It's exactly how I want Thrawn to be yeah. in a live action setting. Um, Absolutely. And then, of chill. course, and of course, Return of the King number two. <laughs> seeing, first of all, you know, as a as a Egyptian American person, a man, <laughs> um, seeing Middle Eastern representation in a Star Wars anything was incredible. <laughs> um, and seeing my boy Ezra, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was just incredible. And like. He nailed the voice inflections down it was to the beautiful. letter. He said it just like oh. It was beautiful. I was like, wow, I'm looking at Ezra. Like, that is Ezra Bridger. That is Ezra Bridger as he's meant to be. Like, my only comment in my notes about Ezra is Ezra's just perfect. Literally, simply perfect. Like, ah, uh, ah, uh, the oh way my God. I knew you'd find me. Wow. Chills, tears. And, like, it's, it's funny because for so long there was that, like, um, the kind of the meme that went around of like a, a Photoshop picture of Ezra with a beard and mustache on that was like, this is what he's going to look like when they find him. Everyone's kind of joking, but he looks exactly like that. That's exactly like what that. he looks like. That's exactly what he looks like. And I can't help but think, I, I had to mention this for, for Matt, that freaking Luke, Leia, and Han are fighting the Galactic Empire in a full-scale rebellion. Obi-Wan and Yoda are just trying to scrounge by and dying, trying to trying to get this one Jedi who knows nothing to fight Darth Vader. And Ezra's just chilling yeah. with some snail people. Literally chilling. <laughs> another galaxy just hanging out. Like, like, oh my god, it's, Ezra. Everything was so perfect. Like, of course Ezra would just be one with these nomadic snail people. Like, that is so Because he has so an ability Ezra. to connect. He's yeah. always been so connected to animals. I, mm-hmm. ugh, I just loved mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if I can rewind for a Absolutely. quick moment, though. Um, something I wanted to just point out that I thought was hilarious um, that I didn't pick up on immediately was in the very beginning, you know, Aaron had mentioned that Hugh Yang, you know, says, you know, talks about the stories, the three volumes of stories he told of the beginning of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. And there happens to be three volumes in the Star Wars movies. And Ahsoka quickly comments, the first one's the best, of course. Yep. And I was like, wow. All right, Dave. Just like immediate, <laughs> just quick one-liner under the radar joke there. And now my headcanon is that Hugh Yang has written all of the opening crawls for all the movies. And that's <gasps> just his his story. That's my new headcanon. We're all watching through Hugh Yang's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so cool. Oh, I want man. the next project to be narrated by him. Like when by you him, buy oh, the DVD, too. there's a Hugh Yang narration. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Hugh Yang. No dialogue. Just Hugh Yang just telling Hugh Yang. me what's happening. <laughs> oh my that god that would be great yes okay so as they're approaching the planet you know mm-hmm. um balen says some stuff about Oof. this is the end of the uh space what do they call them star whales yeah uh journey this is where they would come to die yeah. peridia is a graveyard and as yeah. they're pulling up ooh, that imagery was so spooky of mm-hmm. all the whale bones i was like Oh, it's also kind of giving Lion King. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> and uh, I love the Lion King. So for sure I felt the same vibes. And like, you know, what what I, I don't know, what I think is interesting too is that, you know, 
Previously, we'd only ever heard them referred to as Pergo, mm -hmm. and that's still what the ghost crew refers to them as, but we hear them as space whales, or the Night Sisters call them the Travelers, and um, I don't know, it, 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 it was, it's, it actually, like, it helps it make sense that, like, all the whales leaving, you know, leaving Lothal at that one moment when Ezra beats Thrawn and Rebels, they end up at this point, so it would make sense that these same whales go to this point if it is, like, you know one route that they take back and forth to like, you know, die or, you know, travel, whatever. So yeah. it, it helped make it a little more sense of how the Pergale could just happen to go to the same spot. Yep. Um, so I appreciated Filoni. Yeah. Like it's working almost through that. part of like a migration. Like they, the yeah. pod travels there for yep. the elders to die and mourn them. And then they mm -hmm. travel back. Yeah. The only, the only thing I still need, I, 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 my only complaint, Dave, you got it. You got to explain to me how these people, how they survived this journey. The the Chimera's bridge was shattered when the tentacles yeah. broke through to hold Thrawn in place. Like, these guys, somehow, they got to another galaxy with a shattered bridge. They both survived, and then Ezra somehow Escapes. escaped the ship. I need, I need details filling in what happened here. And I'm hoping that the next episode, when Ezra and Sabine get a chance to talk more, Ezra fills her in on, like, what exactly happened there. But that's my only complaint right now. Yeah. No, I agree. I had thought about that. When the Chimera pulled up, I was like, I thought she was kind of done for. Like, I didn't think, but okay. I mean, she was pretty beat up. You could see it pretty patched together, I feel like. Yeah, that's but, true. Um, and I also, as, as you know, as, as speaking of the Chimera, um, I wonder if you had the same thought here. When you see all the stormtroopers lined up. Mm-hmm. I am, I I am almost one hundred percent convinced that they are reanimated by the Night Sisters. Yep. Because of all the red threads attached yep. to them, and I was like, "Bro, Thrawn has a literal Dude. Night Sister like zombie army at his disposal right now." Dude. Okay. 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 So here's the thing: is I didn't connect that piece at first, but when they started bringing cargo from the catacombs, I'm like, "They're returning to the galaxy with Night Sister zombies. Like that is their army is Night Sister zombies." Yep. But. Yeah, when I watched it again, and I was, like, looking closer at their... Because at first I was like, cool armor. Really love Enoch's, like, um, samurai-inspired yeah, getup. Yeah, I want to know more about that. That's crazy. Yeah, like the Kama, or at least that's what they're called in normal Star Wars. I don't know if that's yeah. the term for, like, the actual garb. <laughs> and then just the style of the helmet. Really cool. But, yeah, it... The second time through, I was thinking probably reanimated and then his extremely modulated voice makes a lot of sense because yep. enoch's voice is more modulated than a typical troopers i 100 percent agree and it's i don't know i just I, I i i love the idea that filoni is going with because like you know it would feel a little like redundant if it was just throng coming back and like trying to like gather like you know imperial, imperial remnants or dissidents to fight for him like it wouldn't feel as i don't know it wouldn't feel as like uh genuine to me yeah or natural versus this to me is like thrawn has never ever again this is something you would learn from rebels and and the books he never turns away from the mystics or the strange things he loves yeah. studying art he loves studying cultures and other and using the abilities of others to help his own cause absolutely and so it makes perfect sense that Thrawn would rely on the Night Sisters and use their, you know, their ancestors and their army to go back and overtake the uh, uh, the uh, uh, New Republic. Yeah, absolutely. And what you're saying about Thrawn being so accepting to other forces, like when you were talking, I'm thinking Thrawn was never that about the Empire. Like, no. he was about the Chiss Ascendancy. He was about yeah, oh. rising to power in a way that he could use <laughs> it for himself. Like, so, yeah, him returning to the galaxy we know just to gather Imperials seems redundant, like you're saying. Yep. It makes total sense. He doesn't need, like, the Empire anymore because they're no longer the top dog. Mm -hmm. And something else, uh, you know, I would assume that most folks who listen to this podcast are, are, are deeply stoked in the lore, but... <laughs> To give a quick little re refresher on the contingency, after the fall of the Empire, the Emperor had a plan in place, very laid out, of 
you know, Project Cinder to burn worlds that were both loyal to the Empire and not to stage a battle on Jakku to draw the New Republic in and try and then blow up the planet and destroy Imperial and New Republic ships and then basically start the Empire over with the First Order and Exegol, you know, with his, you know, you know, he has certain uh, Imperial officers that he has checked off. Yep. But Thrawn's part in all that was to actually, you know, travel into the unknown regions and, like, figure out how to get to Exegol or find all these planets where this might be possible. So Thrawn is aware that there is a plan in place to bring the Emperor back, yet he's acting anyway, which to me kind of confirms in my head that, like, Thrawn knows that there's some plan for the Emperor to come back and the Empire to return. He's not waiting around for that to happen. He is making his move. He's going to go try and take a stake and hold power in this vacuum that's been created. Mm -hmm. And whether he wants to prevent that from happening or not, like, he, I don't think he cares about the Empire at all anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. It's past. It's done. It's dead to him. Mm -hmm. Like, he's mm -hmm. not the type to stick around for a dying horse. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. I will say, speaking more on Thrawn, just incredible. Like, the the leaked images we saw looked so bad. Yeah. In my opinion, there was only least. like There was only one really photo of him, and it was like he was at a weird angle and looked kind of... Yeah, so odd. But just the detail, like, his eyes, perfect, incredible. Oh, my God. So piercing. piercing, so piercing. And the slight prosthetics they did on his forehead and cheekbones... To really bring in the facial structure, I appreciated that attention to detail. And I also appreciated a little bit that I, I you know, we, the Thrawn we know and see in the books and Rebels is younger. He has a lot of resources to, like, be keeping himself super fit and, like, as a warrior. But the Thrawn we see here, obviously, is a little older, a little more rounded. And I think that that speaks to his exile a little bit. And I actually kind of like that he's not in, like, Tip top fighting shape right away. Like I feel like he had other things to worry about. Yeah. Um, and it just to me felt like a natural progression for the character to look that way. Um, but like you said, the eyes, I couldn't look away. My mm -hmm. it just drawn to them. Absolutely. Oh, um, oh my god. That reminded me of something. Oh yeah. And just the voice, like you were saying, it's so iconic and so ugh from Rebels, you know. But um, like you were saying, is how he's aged and rounded out. I thought he did a good job of adding a bit of age to the voice while it's still the yep. same like it sounded like an older Thrawn because that's exactly what it is like just the acting is incredible yep I feel like, and also like I mean you know the actor hasn't aged that much like the last season of Rebels came out five years ago it hasn't been that long mm -hmm. but in you know uh timeline time it's been about mm, 10 years yeah roughly Give or take. um and so it makes you know I, I agree with you the, the he, you know all of the actors have been so true to the characters' voices and inflections from Rebels. It's been actually, I feel like, in incredible it's to watch. Um, it really is. Um, something else I want to I want to bring up here is at the end of the episode, Thrawn. You know, he hears that Ahsoka is coming, basically, mm -hmm. and he you know says, "I need to know." everything i heard that i was like about oh no and then he says specifically i didn't know his her master. her master was and i was like boy because again in the books you know uh thrawn it's, it's revealed that thrawn has had a relationship with anakin dating back to the clone wars um when you know padme essentially was kidnapped and anakin had to go save her and he happened upon thrawn and thrawn helped him rescue padme and then later in life, Thrawn and Vader were together on a mission um, to Batu, And basically you get to see Thrawn interacting with Jedi Anakin and Sith Vader. And so when he hears that Ahsoka is Anakin's apprentice, he's going to have so much to work with there. Yeah. And I'm just – he's the master of like psychologically tearing somebody down and I'm so excited to see what he does here. Yeah. Because – He's one of the very few people who knew that secret. Mm -hmm. and very few. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I heard that. I was like, oh, no. Like, oh, no for my girl. But like, oh, yes, this is about to be so good. Yeah. I, I know we only have two episodes left here. But like, it's I, – I, I feel like that we're going to end this, season, this show every season with them departing or arriving back in the main galaxy because – 
I think we're setting up here for for eventually for Filoni's movie. Yeah, I, uh, I see Thrawn as the big bad in Filoni's movie, and we're gonna bring together. I am I am picturing, and maybe this is just my fan brain wanting this, but an Avengers level event. Yeah, where we have Mando, Grogu, uh, Boba, Fennec, Cal Kestis, Bo Katan. Um, Bo Katan. Um, who's the night sister that runs around with Cal that he's in love with? Marin, thank you. Um, a blank of name. Sabine, Ezra, Ahsoka, Hera. Like, we're going to have all of these people. And honestly, pro- it would probably Luke. Like, yeah. um, we're going to have a lot of people banding together here to fight this Night Sister army and Thrawn. Um, because, you know, obviously we, we know that Thrawn has to lose at some point, you know, if we're going to yep. get to the events of the sequel, the sequel trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't know very much in the interim there. Yeah. So it's a lot of free space for Filoni. Oh, Dave. Oh, Dave. Dave, Dave, Dave. Okay. So moving off of Thrawn, let's talk yes. about Balin and Shin. They had some really good conversations this episode. The most that I think Shin has opened her mouth. Absolutely. Possibly all of the episodes combined are less than what we saw in this episode. I agree. But I loved it, it sh- because, like, a too. she's been such a mysterious and just, like, very Darth Maul-style energy, you know, stalks around, mm. just, like, hunting very much. Obviously, she talks more than Maul. She's not as intimidating. She's a Padawan. We all know that. We can tell. But I really loved seeing them in a, like, Padawan-master relationship where there's no conflict. Like, I was watching this with my mom, and she was like, okay, like, she seems so nice now. Like, what was up with before? I was like, well, you're seeing her when she's not on the offensive. Like, she's comfortable Mm -hmm. with her masters. She's curious. She has questions. Like, the thing that I wrote down when watching it, first I wrote down, Shin Hati, my love. (laughs) And then I wrote down, she just adores Balin. Like, she respects him so much and is so in tune to everything he has to say. Like, when he brought up Mm -hmm. Watching the Jedi Temple burn, just her reaction to that. She looked so, like, afraid and curious. And the acting was really good. Well, I'm curious about that as well in that I wonder if Balin hasn't opened up about this before as much. And so, like, she's learning more. She's, like, excited to hear more about this because she also, like, seems confused at at what she is. Correct. Because, you know, Balin brings up, you know – Ezra was one of, like, these wild Jedi just raised out, you know, without the Order of the Temple. And she was like, like, me. And he goes, no, I raised you. He didn't say to be a Sith or to not be a Jedi, I but to be right something here. more. Say it. Okay. Um, she said, like me. He says, no, he was trained as a Jedi. You I trained to be something more. Mm-hmm. And then she goes on to ask, do you miss it, as in the Order? He says... I missed the idea of it, not the truth, the weakness. There was no future there. And, like, just that one interaction clarified so much for me. And, like, but also it still leaves open ends, but it's just cool to learn more about it. And so he, Balin's reason for being there, you know, Morgan has him there as a mercenary. She thinks she has the power. Thrawn thinks he has the power to send them off to their possible deaths and abandon them on Peridia. But Balin's playing his own game. Balin's playing his own game, and, and we don't know what that game is. Yeah, other than and that's what, to get to this planet because he and feels... And, and he feels that there's, quote, a beginning here. Yeah. He mentions, you know, he feels something stirring on the planet. He can hear it. He can feel it. And, and I, I'm curious what he is seeking here mm-hmm. um, because, you know... Balin is so, like, you know, they've written these characters to be so mysterious because they're not Sith. They're they're not, he's not, see, but the Sith seek absolute power. Correct. Like, Palpatine, Vader, they all wanted power. Unlimited but, power! It, oh, my God. <laughs> but, exactly, though. And, like, but Balin makes a point to say that, that kind of power is fleeting. Like, I am above the pettiness of Palpatine and the Sith's desires, but I also want something more than the failures that the Jedi Order was. Yeah. And he said that he wants to break the cycle. Yep. And, you know, I want to point out that I think that that's, like, 
what he said is so true. I mean, you go back in the history of the galaxy, you know, the old Republic, it rises and it falls and the Sith take over for time. Then, you know, the Republic, it's rise, fall, right? And it's yeah. very much like it's a very cyclical, you know, ordeal. And we never seem to learn from, you know, that. And everyone, you know, everyone seems to think that it just has to be a constant battle between light and dark. Balin's like, I want to break this cycle. It's almost to the point where you want to, like, kind of believe that Balin's right and, like, buy into his cause here. Because it's like, all right, well, yeah, the Jedi Order was wrong and kind of messed up by the end. And the Sith are evil. So what's what's the what's the solution here? And I think Shin wants to know that too, but he seems to be keeping that from her. Shin, to me as well, kind of gives more Darth Maul and more like, I want power. Yeah. I want power. And it's, I could... Go ahead. It's almost like lapdog. You know? Like yep. the pitbull on a leash kind of thing. Yep. Like she isn't fully informed, but she just wants to like, have what she wants and she thinks what she wants is power and i can't you know or maybe it's even she thinks what she should want is power right right and i you know i think that she's also very invested in her master but you can also see her she just dis- she disagrees with him frequently throughout the show she and does. i'm curious if at any point if she breaks and she is the one to kill him um because unfortunately with you know with ray dying in real life um you know, we have to, his character has Balin to has to be tied off, yeah. Somehow, and whether he is maybe he stays know, on Peridia, on planet, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be wild. He's like, this or is my he's place. <laughs> killed or what? Um, but I don't know that. I mean, that would be a very Sith, a, log- a logical Sith ending. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I just I don't know where they're gonna go with it. But I agree that like the, you know, he 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 gets up he gets up to Shin and he he's like you know this is a place of madness of dreams of folklore like of this is a storybook come to life yeah and, um I have the we quote. don't know these stories you have the quote hit me with it he said stories of some ancient past long forgotten and Shin goes with good reason sometimes stories are just stories and he kind of like laughs at that and you don't know what that means you don't know if he's saying like huh. Like, yeah, I guess I agree. Or if he's like, huh, you know so little. <laughs> like, we need the stories of the past. Yeah, and I mean, like, it's funny because it connects to what Hugh Yang and Ahsoka were talking about. Like, he tells these stories in the temple, and I'm curious if one of Huyang's Yang's stories are the stories that Bane was referring to about this place. And I'm sure so, they are. And so if he's giving Ahsoka a refresher right now as they're traveling in the Pergil, like, I don't know. I would like to, I would like to hear... You know what happens in a uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I would I would be curious to know. Um. But yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm very I'm I I'm they, they intrigue me more than I think anyone else's motives because you you kind of know what the motives are of everyone else, but their motives are this dark horse just under the surface through everything, and they have the ability to mess everything up for everyone involved. Yeah. They could screw Thrawn. They could screw Ezra and Sabine. The New Republic. I mean, they, they are they are wild cards. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Every time, so I think I mentioned this last time, but I have dedicated myself to cosplaying Shin. Mm. I'm obsessed with her, and so every time you I have see the her hair on color screen, and everything. right? Every time I see her on screen, I just stare at every detail, and just her and Balin's armor and outfits is so beautiful i didn't even realize until this episode balen's wearing green like he's wearing it it's an emerald green you can I don't see think I realize it, that at all you can see it a little bit when they're approaching in like the hyperspace ring and you can yeah. see it when they're outside talking um when they find the fallen uh people sabine killed what are they called raiders yeah raiders yeah and i then noticed for the first time also that shin her uh, arms are also that same, like, emerald foresty green. And I think it's very interesting because up until now, we've seen them as a very, like, dark and imposing force. So the colors that we've been noticing, Balin, and maybe they did change the costumes, I don't know. But, like, Balin has been appearing a black. Shin has been appearing to be grays. Mm -hmm. But now that they're outside of being the competitors in, like, a direct fight, I wonder if it was intentional for there to be like dimensions of them we didn't see down to the costuming. Mm. 
If not, I just love the costumes and they look cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I have always found that, you know, costuming in Star Wars always has meaning behind it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can even look at Palpatine's robes as they evolved through the prequels. And yep. you can see the, the descent and the, the more and more openly evil he looks. Yeah. Um, so I, it's actually a really good point that I haven't considered. Um, huh. I mean, the orange tint of the lightsabers, the green on their outfits. I mean, it doesn't – it's not giving Sith. Yeah, it seems to be leading somewhere. And honestly, at no point has Balin given me Sith. No. Never once. I mean, at the – the only – I mean, he give he gives me disillusion. like we talked about this uh, the last episode. He gives me disillusioned Dooku mm-hmm. prior to, like, full-on embracing the Sith. Yeah. Um, like Dooku and Tales of the Jedi when he left the Order, almost. Yes, yes. Like, there's a darkness to him, but Balin still is doing what he believes to be good and not just for a power grab. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on. Sabine and Ezra. My loves. My loves. First of all, Sabine, I'm just going <sighs> to... I'm still mad at her. I am still mad at her. And my anger is continuing through the end of the episode. But um, it's just so funny. All through the episode, first she's on a prison, in a prison on the hyperspace ring. And she's like, we had a deal. We had a deal. <laughs> and then later she's in the prison on Peridia and she's going, we had a deal. <laughs> and, and then she's with Thrawn and, and she's like, just tell me where Ezra is, you piece of crap. <laughs> literally. But I loved that moment of, She's in the prison on Peridia and kind of seems to be in despair. And she says, like, Ahsoka, like, what am I doing? And then she goes and tries to use the Force. And we see some dust falling and, like, things rumbling. And for a moment, you're meant to think maybe she's using the Force. And then it's the Chimera. The like, chimera. that was so cool. It's like, oh, uh, this thing that's, like, meant to give people, like, maybe a little hope. No, it's Thrawn. Yep. Nope. It is. It is. It's Thrawn. literally Thrawn. It's literally. Thrawn. Um, yeah. I, I they keep poking fun at her that she can't use the force, which makes me feel like she has to use it at some point. She has to. I feel like um, Ezra is going to be the one who can help her get there. Yeah, well, I agree. I think I think that's going to happen. I, I also think that, you know, my, one of my friends have pointed out that Sabine didn't have a overwhelming reaction when she first saw Ezra, like after seeing waiting for so long, like it was very it was, it was there was still a reaction, but it was more subtle. It was, and I pointed out I think that it's because she's carrying an immense amount of guilt. She's so guilty. Like she's yeah. like, I found him, but what did I do? And what he says to her, he says, she, he says, I knew you'd find me. It took you long enough. She said, you didn't tell anyone where you were going. He says, well, it worked, didn't it? And his face falls a little. He goes, didn't it? And she's like, yes, yes, it did work. And holds back the, but I just undid it by coming here. <laughs> yep. Yep. Like, you succeeded. Good job. Um, but, like, yeah, but now I'm. He says, how do you find, how did you find me? How are you riding a howler? And she's like, I don't want to talk about it. Can't I just be happy I found you? And Ezra knows. Like, he knows she did something, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. He. I mean, like, there's no other way for her to get to another galaxy like that without something some other presence helping is like she shows up alone yeah with no ship no nothing riding a howler he's like all right sabine what is going on and he, but I, you know ezra's also very happy to see sabine i mean we have to remember absolutely. that like you know at first he was like in love with her um yep. <laughs> and then he like saw her as a sister and i think that like you know the excitement that both of them are both the excitement that both of them are feeling is overwhelming any of their other concerns at the moment yeah but, like, I don't know. I think that, like, we're going to have to have some conversations next episode. Like Ezra has to tell her how he survived. Sabine has to explain how she got there, how she gave Thrawn the way back home. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I get why. I get that, like, she decided to do it. And, like, Hugh Yang even made the point that maybe it was the only choice that she could make. Mm-hmm. But she could have saved the whole galaxy from Thrawn. Yeah. She just destroyed that little map yeah yeah speaking on kind of their interaction their excitement it was interesting to me because like you said at first he was in love with her 
And throughout this whole show, my mom's been asking me, were they together? Like, are they dating? Like, does she love him? And I was like, no. Like, they were like siblings, you know? But she is very desperate to find him and very focused on, oh, I have no other family, even though Hera and Zeb and Chopper and Jason are all here. Like, mm-hmm. and then when they did reunite, I was like, oh, this is wonderful, you know? And they like hugged and then they kind of like stood back from each other and she um grabbed his arm and they both kind of like looked at it and then like stepped backwards i was like there's just interesting vibes like for a second i was like are they about to kiss right now like that wouldn't make any sense that's my that was my yeah my, i was also feeling the yeah same but the emotions are complicated for sure and i think that kind of just goes to what you were saying like there's so much excitement it's just kind of overdrive um overwriting any concerns or other thoughts or considerations yeah i also had the same thought of like are they gonna kiss right now yeah. that wouldn't make any sense to me either but like i mean there were I, again you know early on in rebels ezra being you know a young kid had a crush on her but i think that it, like it was much more a child crush than matured into like a brother sister very close relationship um i don't know yeah, I'm just interested to see where it goes. Because, of course, we have this very firm brother-sister relationship idea from them. But, again, remembering the casual fans and how Dave Filoni is absolutely taking them into account. So what is Dave trying to do? Like, is he yep. just trying to confuse them? Or is there something that's going to happen? We're going to find out. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Complicated emotions. What else do we want to say? Anything? Any thoughts on Sabine, though, specifically? Because we saw a lot of her throughout this episode that had nothing to do with Ezra. Yeah, I, you know, I thought that you know it was cool to see Sabine in um, you know, I get why they don't want her to have her helmet on, and I know she left it behind in you know the other galaxy, but mm-hmm. I just want to see more combat with her with her full armor on. Yeah. Um, but. You know, I seeing her use her different Mandalorian tools. I mean, she was using that little that little rope thing that comes out of Electrode her gauntlet. Rope. She was using uh, her lightsaber, her blasters. I mean, it was cool to see her. You know, as she was in Rebels, a very multifaceted warrior. Um, you know, she was trained by Ezra with the dark saber, trained by Ahsoka a little more with the lightsaber, and to see her like in Mandalorian style combat, just kind of whipping it all over the place. I thought was really fun to watch. Real quick, you meant she was trained by Kanan with the dark saber, right? Yes, I didn't mean Ezra. It's all good. Well, you know, technically, they both helped. Ezra took her through the basic forms for three days. You know what? That's right. Ezra started. So, it. He gets who credit. trained her more, Ezra or <laughs> Kanan, who just insulted her until she got mad enough to be good? That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. But yeah. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought. I really loved the Howler. That was so cute. I love when they do like a little bit of humor, you know? Oh, yeah. How the Howler tossed her and then came back like a sad puppy. And she was like, no, you abandoned me. (laughs) And it tries to follow her. And we get this really great shot of her walking over a bridge. The Howler starts to follow. She just turns around and points away. And And he just starts walking. He just turns around and walks away. We see her stalk off the bridge. And then he comes trotting afterwards. It was very sweet. I, it, it also was giving that, you know, it was giving mangy loath wolf vibes. Yeah, totally. And I was like, nice, nice. I don't, it, it feels like I, I always enjoy seeing new creatures in Star Wars. And, you know, we got to see two. I really enjoyed the well-dressed, you know. Yeah. A lot of people are calling them snail, like, I guess snail crab mixed Snarts. creatures. Almost like hermit crabs, like little claws. Um, they were really cute, and I like how Ezra took the time to carve each of them a little rebel pendant. So cute. Um, I mean, he's had plenty of time, but yeah, when they stood up and he had a little bow tie, I was like, no way. Yeah, and then they went to the village, and they're all just ha- all like well dressed, and I'm like, dude, either Ezra made these clothes for them, or like these people are just well dressed all the time on this desolate, desolate planet. Run by the Night Sisters. Just drippy folk. <laughs> um, I also don't think I expected. When I came into the show, were you expecting the presence of the Night Sisters to be so? No, 
immense. Yeah, that was my next point. Like, let's talk on the Night Sisters quick, and then we got to do our little member section. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. What I wrote down I... about the Night Sisters, the first thing I wrote down, the other great mother. Because my great mother is Mother Talzin. Last my great I mother, checked. You mean your great mother who was defeated by... But she's still... Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> She's still in spirit. <laughs> she was defeated by Jar Jar Binks. Look, Mace Windu was there too, okay? Yeah. What was he doing? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. It's a really unfortunate set of episodes that I wish didn't happen. <laughs> Jar Jar Binks never needed to have a love interest. I think that was Filoni just giving all oh. of us the middle finger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They said, you're going to cancel my show? Okay, here we go. Jar Jar gets a love story. Yeah, that... Oh, my God. I'd rather not dwell on that. Um... But I just, <laughs> I thought it was funny as in like Coraline, you know, the mother, her mother and then her other mother, they go to a different galaxy. It's a the other great mother. But I did look at it and I was trying to figure out. At first I was like, there's no way that's Talzin. The head shape is 100% different. But when I looked at it more, the um, the facial markings are almost identical. It looks like it could be a live action take on Mother Talzin. Um, I don't think that it is, but I just thought that was interesting. She has the same, like, winged eyeliner almost, and then the dark under her cheekbones. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Is that just the marks of great shamans? I think it's just a mark. And, like, you know, what, what I I think, you know, if we recall, and when we're, when we're on Dathomir, mm-hmm. um, in oh, the Clone Wars, okay, Grievous invades Dathomir. Um, Ventress is there to fight alongside the Great Mother. This is when, like, the Night Sisters are really decimated yep. on Dathomir. And we see the Great Mother, but we also see another, like, really elderly member of the Night Old Sisters Daka. who, like... What did you say? Old Daka is her name. Yeah, that's her name. I couldn't remember her name. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and she also is, like, she's the one who's, like, reanimating all of the zombies. And, like, to me, the Great Mother mantle... It's kind of like a shaman or like a like a chief of a of a tribe, and you know Odaka being an elder, you know she was probably a great mother before Mother Towson, and the Mother Towson was the one in power at that time. And yeah. so to me, I think that mantle can be passed down. Almost, um, yeah. And if this is like the home world of the Dathomiri, you know it could have been these are three, like the three great mothers, like three of the tribe leaders or three of the leaders of the planet as a whole, and. Um, I don't know. I was so ecstatic to see, um, you know, the Night Sisters and the, the Great Mothers in live action. So cool. Um, I was just, I was not expecting it. I just, I like, when I came into the show, I think the last thing I would have pegged is like, all right, it's going to be a lot of Rebels follow up. The Night Sisters do not have a presence in Rebels. They don't. And T- Filoni said, no, no, we're bringing the Clone Wars and the Rebels. You're an animation fan. You're eating. You're eating at this table, and you're yes. going to like it. I got a feast, he said. <laughs> yeah, no, it's wonderful. Because, same, I never saw it coming. I don't know if there were hints dropped in Mandalorian that I missed about uh, Morgan Elsbeth being a night sister or a witch of some sort, but I never saw it coming, and I'm so glad that it's here because the night sisters are one of my favorite parts of the Clone Wars and the lore. It's so exciting to see them in a bigger platform that will reach more casual fans. And I, you know, it's funny because I remember people saying, you know, like they would never like everyone, everyone. Okay. Anytime anything happens in Star Wars, someone goes, that doesn't feel like Star Wars. That's too weird. That's too out there. The immediate argument someone responds is, well, in the Clone Wars, there was a, there was a zombie army and everyone's like, yeah, that's just animation. They would never do that in real Star Wars. (laughs) And now we're going to have a live action Night Sister zombies running around fighting New Republic troops. Oh, it's gonna be great. Oh, it's gonna be so good. It, I, yeah, I, I don't even like. Thrawn. Oh man. <laughs> Thrawn commanding an army like that is gonna be incredible. Yeah. But yeah, I think that like I was not expecting that presence, and also like, it's cool the way that Filoni has really. It's all been very subtle, you know. Like, there's been no over the top magic happening they, they seem like you know very um oh wait i just thought of something Ooh. so it just dawned on me 
Okay. Filoni likes to draw on a lot of classical references. And in Macbeth, in the beginning of that, you have this this king, essentially, you know, go up to these three witches. And he essentially is like, ask them to help him tell his future. And he goes on their advice in an effort to, like, you know, they basically tell him, you're going to become the king. You're going to rule all over the land. Like, it's destined for you to do that. And so he, following that advice, like, goes out and tries to rule and like does a lot of really ill-advised kind of sketchy things and he becomes a ruler for a while but it eventually comes back to bite him and he dies and to me it's giving that same vibe of like Thrawn is relying on these three witches and even Shin does not trust them at all every time she sees one she's like more witches more witches she does not like Um, the witches (laughs) does not she does not she is (laughs) anti-witch um but it's it's just giving that same vibe of like Thrawn is putting a lot of faith in these witches and their and their magic, which like he has no other choice right now, obviously. Mm-hmm. But unless he breaks away at some point, I feel like that could end up being his undoing in the end. That's because the Night Sisters don't give their magic for free. No, they absolutely do not. Not unless you're a sister. Um. Yeah. And also, oh. sorry. I'm sorry. One more note. Mm-hmm. That same thing, the, the Macbeth thing, is actually drawn also, if I remember, from the three fates from Greek mythology. Like the three yep. fates that like control – and they keep mentioning like the strings of fate and like this is a loose thread. Yes. It actually is probably giving more Greek mythology fates than anything else now that I'm thinking about it even more. And the same thing happens. Every time someone listens to the three fates, they end up kind of like try, trying to change their own destiny and end up losing in the end. And so Filoni is following these archetypes that have been laid down so many centuries ago. And Thrawn is playing that proud villain that he's going to gain a lot of success. And he's going to, I think he's going to reach that mantle for a moment. And it's all going to come crashing down on him. Yeah. That parallel really um, makes your statement of, it makes the statement ring true of Return of the King. It really does. Because, yeah, in that parallel he's a king and they are the fates or they are the witches like that's very cool i'm glad you made that connection i never would have thought of that yeah i literally just thought as i was talking but any closing thoughts on the episode things notes you had you want to say yeah i don't think so i think i just uh, my biggest question leaving here is like you know even if ahsoka confronts thrawn like what can that look like thrawn's not gonna fight ahsoka i don't think he's gonna have someone else do it is enoch gonna fight ahsoka is you know, what, like I, I'm just very curious how this all kind of shakes out in the end. Yeah. Um, because I don't, I just don't know how Thrawn, like, like Thrawn's gonna take the Chimera back to the galaxy now that he has the waypoints. Yep. But Ahsoka, Ezra, um, Sabine, and uh, all have to escape, and unless they can somehow get the coordinates from, you know, steal them from Thrawn. I, I don't know how they're going to get home. I don't know. There's just a lot of question marks to wrap up in two episodes, yeah. and I'm they almost hoping have to. we get a re- really long last episode. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have to go back on the chim- Chimera. It's the only option yeah. I can see, unless Filoni gets really creative, which he does often, but... Well, right, because I guess a, nor- a normal, like, their small oh, starship that Ahsoka's traveling in... Alex, Ezra communes with the animals. He'll be like, Pergil, take us home. That would be kind of awesome, actually. I mean, I, I feel like that's that. how it's gonna go. Actually, <laughs> um, I would actually kind of—I I would actually be kind of electric. I would—I would love that. Yeah. Um, one other quick thought, and then we'll, I know we have to do our member content, but I'm curious. This is outside of this episode. Do you think there will be, and do you think there needs to be, a moment where Ezra communes with Kanan in some respect? I think I would Whether it's love Force it, Ghost. but I don't think it's necessary in this show. Mm-hmm. I don't think it really aligns with the plot currently. Will we possibly see it in the future media containing Ezra? I hope so. That would be really cool. Or maybe even like Sabine having some sort of connection of sorts. Who knows? Or maybe Ahsoka. Yeah. Like I would love to see Kanan contacted in some way. That would be yeah. wonderful. I go back and forth on it because I – he Ezra got his closure – on Lothal when the temple went down after the war between worlds. Mm-hmm. But we also hear Freddie Prince Jr.'s voice. We hear Kanan's voice speak to Ray on Exegol. So yep. we know that like his consciousness has survived, but that is canonically true. So it would believe, it would lead me to believe that at some point, especially like in Ezra's exile, that maybe he found a figure out some way. 
mm-hmm. very Obi Wan to like talk to his former master. Um, not necessarily need to see like a Force Ghost of Ezra in the last three seconds of the final episode, yeah. saying, "Where have you been, man?" Kind of like Qui Gon did with Obi Wan, yeah. but. Um, I would, I think at some point, whether it's this show or some other medium, I would like to see some connection there. But yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I actually, I didn't forget, but I like forgot. Uh, we do have a little bit of a feedback that we're going to respond to here. Okay. Um, that Matthew sent ahead. Um, they wrote to me. No. I don't know. It says, Dear Aaron, longtime listener, but this is the first time to write in. You've been such a great addition to the podcast, and when I heard you get to host on your own again, I knew I wanted to send in some thoughts. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad you did. They say, First, I'm wondering, what do you think of the timing of all the big reveals this week? The turtle people were adorable, and it was great to see Ezra, but honestly, I was just so frustrated when we left Thrawn. He was everything I've been hoping to see, and I wanted the whole episode focused on him. That being said, Ezra having made some friends with local sentient animals like creatures <laughs> is so wonderful. It's so wonderfully on brand and it's hard to be mad at. Most of all, I'm just so excited that we have the night, which is again, us too. Uh, they said in the Clone Wars, they always wanted to stay out of the Republic separatist fight. I'd love to hear any theories as you all have as to why they're so behind Thrawn at this time. Thanks again. I always learn so much when I listen to you talk Star Wars. So sweet. That was very sweet. Thank you for writing in. Aaron is the best. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do just want to, before we talk about the Night Sisters, I want to, to his earlier point, I think that the beauty of Thrawn is we don't get to see him very often. He is very, like, kind of like Vader is in a lot of media. Like, his presence is so imposing but it, it would lose some of that fear if you gave him too much screen time. And so I yeah. think that, like, while I also was like, give me more Thrawn. I want to look into your beautiful red eyes. Mm-hmm. It, it was necessary to, like, only give you sparing tastes of him to keep that aura around him. Yeah, like, the mystery is a big part of his menace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense first- to me. I, I agree. When, it went, when the episode ended, I just didn't want it to. I was like, no, oh, did I. I need more. Like, what do you mean? It was The music was swelling, and I was like, can we go back to, like, Ahsoka and Huang? Can I just have a few more minutes? Like, anything, anything, please? And then the episode ended, but... And then the Night Sisters. what are your thoughts on this? The Night Sisters. why are they so about it? They have ulterior motives, like everyone does. Every single person in this puzzle has different motives. Sabine has her motive of Ezra. Thrawn has his motive of returning and doing something. Morgan has her motive of getting to the Night Witches. Balin has his motive of question mark. And so the Night Sisters, the Great Mothers, absolutely have a motive. And it could just be to... Sorry, go ahead. Everyone has a motive except Ezra. Correct. As per usual. He's as per Jay usual. chillin' and I love he to is see He is literally, it. Ezra is a definition of vibe. Oh, I, oh, I'm so obsessed with him. I'm so obsessed with him. I can't wait to see more. But I agree with you. Yeah, so it could be as simple as just wanting to repopulate the other galaxy and just make their presence strong there once again. But they also made some comments about the planet dying. So it seems like it's sort of an evacuation, like a relocation of sorts yeah i mean we only see three living night sisters the three mothers there and the rest are those catacombs that we're, we're assuming and i think it's pretty clear based on the shape of the boxes that they are corpses of night sisters yeah. that are being going to be reanimated elsewhere but um i agree that i, I have of the mindset that it, it seems to be a, some sort of an evacuation of the dying planet plus like you know the dathomir witches have been wiped out um with very very few sparing survivors in the galaxy i mean we've mm-hmm. only know of like two if you count with a thousand three um and so i think a, a part part of it is repopulating um and it's also possible you know they keep to themselves to a certain degree but we saw in the clone wars the brother Towson did seek a greater power to try and like you know take more power and take a larger role in the galaxy yeah. and i think that the net sisters could see this fledgling republic and this power vacuum that's been created and are like we can make our own stance. We can we can, we can put our stake in it. And like whether that has Thrawn leading it or not, I think they're like this is our ticket to that galaxy. This is a ticket away from this dying planet. 
like you said, everyone has an ulterior, everyone has an ulterior motive, and they're all colliding at the same time, which makes yeah. it really interesting. Yeah, and I think to whoever wrote in, I didn't see a name, but thank you for writing in again. But um, I don't think we have a motive yet. As in, like, you kind of asked, what do you think they're wanting? I don't think we're supposed to know yet. And like we've seen, I think they're almost doing kind of what Balin had said to Shin. When they saw the raiders and she grabbed her lightsaber, Balin says, no need for violence. The enemy of our enemy is our friend. Or the enemy, yeah. And so I think that's probably the type of relationship Thrawn and the Great Mothers have worked out. Is like, we are working with each other to get out of here, basically. I think it's as simple as that. We're working with each other to get out of here. And once we get there, we both probably have different ideas of where we want to end up. But based on the night troopers that we see, which that's what Thrawn's troopers are called, I saw in the subtitles. But based on the night troopers, it is implied that they're tied to an extent because if the Great Mothers just dip on him, Thrawn doesn't have an army. And maybe that's how he falls. Or part of how he falls is something motivates them. But who knows? Yeah. Well, here we are. (laughs) The end of the episode. Thank you for coming along, everybody. Alex, real quick, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, uh, they, well, they can find me on Instagram at alexcorman12. That's A-L-E-X-K-O-R-M-A-N-N-12. Um, I'm also a, I work as a photographer if anyone's interested in some cool photos. Um, they're on there or my website, alexcormanphoto.com. Yeah. yeah. Me, I'm at Lady Tunnel Creates on Instagram and TikTok. Just tons of cosplay BS on both of those. So check it out if you're interested. And Aaron and I are going to be going and hanging out at Twin Cities Con, meeting Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Anakin's voice actors. Oh my god, um, I'm so excited! She's going to be Ahsoka, I'm going to be Anakin, so you will definitely see some pictures on there yes, at some point soon. Absolutely. And if you're in the Twin Cities area, come to the con, hit me up, and we can like... Come meet up, take con. pictures. Like, I'd love to they meet They keep adding people. people, dude. It's going to be crazy. Yeah, it's going to be a great con. But I don't remember exactly how Matthew ends. I think he says, have a great week. And, and may the force be with you. We have spoken. Oh, yeah, we have spoken. <laughs>